Thank you, Rob. I know we're running over, and I appreciate people's patience. We have one final speaker, that's Sunil Agarwal. Uh, he spoke yesterday, and I had the pleasure of meeting him a couple weeks ago in Santa Barbara. Uh, he hold, He's a fourth-year MD, PhD student at the University of Washington in Seattle. Uh, he's an active member of Washington's Physicians for Social Responsibility, holds a BS in Chemistry and a BA in Philosophy from UC Berkeley. And currently, he is studying medical geography. Uh, Sunil's areas of interest include the political ecology of health and disease, structural violence and human rights, and subjective health-related quality of life, all especially in the context of human cannabis relations. Today, he is here to give us a crash course on uh, marijuana use and mental health. I'm sure all of you have seen the headlines that come out of most of the UK, this country a little bit too, and also Australia and New Zealand. I call it reefer madness redux, uh, this idea that somehow smoking marijuana um, will greatly damage your mental health, and Sunil is here to set the story straight. Um, I know he's in the process just now of setting up the PowerPoint, um, and please give us about another 10, 15 minutes of your time for Sunil Agarwal. We asked to be on this panel, Paul, thank you very much. We've talked about uh, can cannabis in the heart, cannabis in the brain, cannabis in the body. Now this is cannabis in the mind. <laughs> so um, mental health and cannabis, loose ends, uh, that's what Paul asked me to talk about. And what, what came to mind for me was this, uh, this recent debate about schizophreniform, schizophrenic psychosis symptoms, which of course was originally part of the Reefer Madness campaign in the 1930s, but uh, you know, with some extra extra fi fixings on it, uh, a little more modern spin on it. So I'm going to give you a little bit of a, what I understand. I've been following the debate just a little bit. I don't, I'm not an expert on all the studies. So I'll just tell you some of the conclusions that um, what I believe to be reputable studies of, or uh, reviews of these studies have showed. And then the other thing I want to talk about is cannabis abuse disorder. When you see the word abuse, you see the word disorder, don't forget the, there's a word in between abuse and disorder, and that's the word mental. Um, so, and I don't know if it sounds any worse to you, but there is something called a mental disorder called ca cannabis abuse mental disorder. It has a diagnostic code in the DSM. Uh, and I'm going to talk to you about that and kind of how there is a bit, a bit of moralism embedded in, in our modern day advanced 21st century psychiatry, which is supposed to be all about a brain science now, but you'll be surprised to learn that, um, you know, it still hasn't changed. And uh, is it really more of a governmental disorder than a mental disorder? And that's what I'm going to talk about. So please bear in mind that mental illness has always been a source of misunderstanding, fear, and social contestation. Um, to, to, what, to what extent is it socially constructed? biologically grounded, or is it a little bit of both? I mean, difference, as Bob Melvin was telling us, we have a variety of different mental states in the population. You know, what's normal, what's abnormal. Um, uh, psychiatrists like to like to talk about functionality and adaptation, and so we're going to see how those terms kind of play out. Uh, this is the book I'll be talking about, um, Diagnostics and Statistical Manual for Mental Disorders. Uh, fourth it's been around for many years. 90, 94 was the last sort of total revision of it. But it, uh, yes? So, you know, I, I believe actually uh, the marijuana policy project and some other groups are trying to influence DSM 5. I believe that is in the world since it's so old. Super. Well, okay, well, um, tell them about this. Um, but we'll get to that. Now, here's the facts <laughs> higher rates of cannabis use and other psychoactive substances. Um, does occur in, pop, in schizotypic populations compared to the general population. Just We know that with population studies. You ask a bunch of people who have been classified as schizophrenic or schizo, schizophreniform. It's a whole range. I'll use the word schizotypic, okay? And they use more psychoactive substances compared to the general population. Cause, effect, association, helping, hurting, what? I don't know. But that association exists. And in predisposed individuals, cannabis use can exacerbate psychotic symptoms that were once in remission. So you can talk to people who say, yeah, I was diagnosed with uh, schizophrenia in my uh, 20s, and uh, it, was, it was bad for a while, and then I used cannabis, and it got worse. It went away, and then I used cannabis, and it got worse. These kinds of things have been, uh, there's been uh, cases of this, of this occurring. And then the question is, 
whether or not <coughs> cannabis use can unmask schizotypic, pre schizotypic predisposed individuals, genetic, genetic predispositioned individuals. There's, there's talk about a gene called the catechethyl o methyltransferase is involved in dopamine synthesis in your brain. And they think that people who have a certain type of this gene may be more predisposed to getting schizophrenia earlier. I mean, this is all just kind of, gen these genetic studies are very speculative. And um, I mean, you might be able to infer from the second point that the third point might be true, um, but we don't really know. There's some weak evidence. So, um, oops, I just jumped to the end of my talk. That's the conclusion. Uh, <laughs> currently accepted medical psychiatric definition. And they want to call it medical psychiatry now so we get more and more like a, you know, grounded in, in science and in physicality. Um, this is the basis of public health prevention, treatment, and diagnosis. Okay, so you can think, look at the, think about the prohibition of cannabis marijuana laws as cannabis abuse disorder prevention laws. I mean, that's what that's what they're that's what that's what, how they're built in the in the federal law. This is a prevention of uh, abuse. So what's abuse? Okay. So in the DSM, they tell us that it's a maladaptive pattern of cannabis use leading to clinically significant impairment or distress as manifested by one or more of the following occurring in a 12-month period. So recurrent cannabis use resulting in a failure to fulfill major obligations at work, um, like school or home. And here's some examples you can look there. Um, recurrent cannabis use in situations that are physically hazardous, like uh, flying airplanes or operating machinery when impaired by cannabis use. Criterion A3 is recurrent cannabis-related legal problems. And criterion A4 is cons continued cannabis use despite having persistent <coughs> or recurrent social or interpersonal problems caused or exacerbated by the effects of cannabis, arguments with spouse over the consequences of intoxication, physical bites. Now, um, you can get this diagnosis in one of 15 possible ways. You only need one of those four criteria to satisfy the diagnosis. And um, in total, there's 15 possible diagnostic combinations. And so you can, this could be an official diagnosis that I can write based on these. Patient X has a maladaptive pattern of, clinically, of, of substance use leading to clinically significant impairment or distress as manifested by recurrent, recurrent substance-related legal problems occurring within a 12-month period. You are nuts. You're, you have a mental disorder on your record. You can be treated now. Okay. All right. So uh, let's say you want some guidance on what legal problems are. You're like, so, you know, come on, you're overplaying it. What are these legal problems all about? What does it say about that? Well, they tell us legal problems can arise from substance related disorderly conduct. Legal problems may occur as a consequence of arrest for cannabis possession. <coughs> Um, also, in the, well, the other uh, substances, it also mentions possession and, and use. Uh, so you can get cocaine abuse, solution and abuse disorder, all these ones, just, just based on possession and related legal problems. Tells us that the category of substance abuse does not apply to caffeine or nicotine. <laughs> so all that coffee stuff that uh, we were talking about, doing the studies with coffee, I mean, well, it's not uh, something that we worry about with abuse. So what are you talking about? Um, the term abuse should only be applied to a pattern of substance use that meets the criteria for this disorder. It's not a synonym for use or misuse. We're talking about abuse here. And um, they tell us that the legal problems, not only can they be recurrent, but they can just be persistent. So if you've been dealing with one legal issue for a whole year or majority of a year, that's a persistent problem. Okay, and then this is, this is the greatest. I mean, this is how the moralism gets embedded into our accepted definitions. Substance related disorders are distinguished from non pathological <coughs> substance use, for example, social drinking, <laughs> and from the use of medications for appropriate medical purposes by the presence of a pattern of multiple symptoms occurring over an extended period of time, tolerance, withdrawal, compulsive use, or the presence of substance related legal problems. Um, sorry, substance <coughs> problems. And as you can see, one of those problems is legal problems. This is all straight from a the official book here. So some of the, co the corollaries and implications is one way that social drinking is an example of non-pathological substance use can be distinguished from pathological cannabis-related use disorders, mental disorders, is by the presence of legal problems. <laughs> yeah. 
And one way that the use of medications for appropriate medical purposes can be distinguished from pathological cannabis-related use disorders is by the presence of legal problems. Again, <laughs> so it's not, it's not considered that medications might, in fact, not be legal. We're not. Why would that be the case? And that other forms of non-pathological substance use are possible with substances aside from alcohol, nicotine, and caffeine. That's, that's what they're telling us. This is, so inaction. So this is well, this here's some of the implications of what this what this uh, criteria does. So the National Household Survey, the Survey on Drug Abuse, 2003, the big survey everyone hears about. So in their questions, they ask this question: During the past 12 months, did you using marijuana or hashish cause you to do things that repeatedly got you into trouble with the law? Yes or no? And um, in 2003, uh, they, I, I looked at the figures, and 13.685 percent of the people answered yes to that question. And from those figures, the uh, Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration releases a big press release. There are 22 million people in America who are abusing or dependent on drugs. Okay, uh, you can imagine. I mean, that's a, you extrapolate from a sample. Okay, if 13% of the sample had answered yes to this question, that extrapolates to a huge number of people who have this uh, who are abusing drugs. Um, it's a big, big press just based on this one criteria. You can see how this it gets used. Also, in a, another study was done in JAMA, and it was talking about uh, the increase of uh, cannabis abuse disorders among Hispanic uh, populations. And Mitch Erlewine, once again, um, wrote a really um, pointed reply to that. He said, recurrent marijuana-related legal problems qualify users for abuse diagnosis because marijuana arrests increased dramatically in, this dec in the decade study that, that could account for the observed increases in disorders. So, I mean, this, this, is, this stuff is, is really used in our... Um, Excuse me. Um, okay, so the big questions. Is there any other medical explanation other than underlying cannabis abuse mental disorder that would explain why individuals engage in cannabis use that could lead to legal problems or has a high potential of doing so? That, that's the question that, 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 that's missing here. I mean, I was just thinking about, we, we, uh, we were kicked out of the room from the Tommy Chong documentary. Um, they, I can't, people at normal conferences are very anti-authoritarian, okay? So they come in and tell you, you cannot do this. And then I, someone came to our table and said that the cops are coming too, right? So they're threatening legal problems, right? <laughs> Welcome to legal problems, right? But some stay, right? Those people who stayed all are, probably have a mental disorder, <laughs> according to the DSM. They are sick. They're sick people. That's, that's exactly what, that's, that, that's the implication that comes from this. Yeah, you're crazy. Yeah, you're crazy. Okay. Uh, okay, wrap it up. Okay, so will we let moralism influence our answers to this question? Um, or will we have radical empiricalism and reason? Radical empiricalism is a term that William James came up with, and he was talking about you can directly experience something yourself and know. What, what, what the reason is that people would be using a substance like this even through risking legal problems, right? Um, you can imagine there's so many different ways you could, you could find out about this, but you see we're not asking those questions. And um, I just wanted to remind you that homosexuality was officially a sociopathic personality disturbance until 1973 in the DSM. Nowadays we call that antisocial personality disorder, mental disorder. Okay, so we still, still just keep changing these terms, but... It, and, and don't forget that um, uh, I think only 50% of people who are treated for marijuana abuse or addiction are referred by the, the legal system nowadays. And this is exactly the, the piece that allows some doctor to sign off on every one of those individuals who come in um, with the legal problem. Somebody has to say he has a disorder in order for them to be treated. Right. If you've got legal problems, okay, you got a disorder, we'll treat you, let's go. I mean, otherwise you, would, you shouldn't be treating people who aren't sick, right? Okay, so... I'll, Ask me, I'll tell you a story about my conversation with Dr. Nora Volk, the director of NIDA, um, on this issue uh, recently. It was uh, very enlightening to see how um, they conflate cannabis with these other potent substances that perpetuates this, uh, this idiocy. And um, anyway, that's the, uh, that's the conclusion I want to come to. Um, and uh, thank you for your time. Thank you so much to all of our panelists. It's good to know that not only are we right in the world of uh, morals, of truth, and freedom, what is just, but science is on our side as well. <laughs>